Next speaker is Natalie Voss. Natalie is a group leader and deputy director of Max Planck Queensland Centre and Bone and Tumor Bioengineering Group. Um, Natalie is going to speak to us about developments in bioengineering, bone and tumor models. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, um, as said, I'm part of the Max Planck Queensland Centre, which is um, a you know, uh, work between QUT uh, in Brisbane, but also some Max Planck Institute based in Germany uh, for intelligent systems and uh, interfaces and colloids. So I'll start straight away because I won't have 10 minutes to, to give you something that is quite a bit different to what we've heard so far because I'm a bioengineer. And so the, the current clinical problem is that when we try to design new drugs and we test them in clinical models, we still have a very high um, failure rates for those drugs, which means that um, the preclinical studies usually use mice and what works in mice do not work in uh, humans. So this is not only a problem in wasting medical resources, but it's also a problem uh, for the patients. If we specifically look at those failures in terms of therapeutic areas, we can clearly see that oncology is where we have the highest degree of failures. And that's because cancer compared to other types of disease have a very, very, uh, are very complex and uh, heterogeneous in nature. So it interacts with the macro environment and it's very clever in adapting and, and resist to most treatments. And this is why we need our better preclinical disease models. And so in uh, my research and some others in the Max Planck, we actually work into humanizing the mice so that we try to create human organs. And because of the time today, I, will, I won't show you this work, but we are advancing um, humanizing the bone and other organs and other uh, part of the bodies. But also we can just also try to advance the complexity of in vitro models. So currently, um, if you worked uh, as a scientist, you know that a lot of us work with 2D models and we know this is not representative as humans because we are 3D. So that's why we wanna develop human uh, 3D in vitro models. So I focus on bone metastasis and um, my, my core uh, interest was prostate, then it's been gone to a breast, renal and lung, which are all the cancers that metastasize to the bone. But in the interest of time, I'll just show you an example with um, prostate. So this is a highly diagnosed cancer and we know that um, in advanced prostate cancer, we can have bone metastasis and we have a very low survival rate. So as you can see here, we have a typical project pro progression of the cancer over time. Um, typically it's androgen uh, sensitive, so it's very successful with local therapies. If you are in the luck unlucky uh, percentage that will recur, we can use androgen uh, deprivation therapy, ADT. If that recurs again, then we use what's called androgen targeted therapies when we really target the AR um, uh, receptor, which is really uh, responsible for, for growth of the cancer. Um, however, we still don't um, understand that despite those advanced therapies that are heavily used in the clinic at the moment, some of them are called enzalutamide, bicalutamide, and they actually extend your life quite for a long time. Uh, there are very recent study extending more than five years your, your life. However, um, they still, there is still some adaptive resistance, uh, response of the cancer cells in some of the macro environment, um, not only in the bone, but also other organs where the cancer has um, has reached. So um, this is just a, a brief uh, reminder that um, bone metastasis happen because of a ba imbalance between um, your bone cells. So you have mostly your bone uh, forming cells, the osteoblast, and the bone the resorbing cells, the osteoclasts. And in breast cancer, you have more resorption, osteolysis. So you have uh, like this big hole in your bones. And in prostate cancer, more often you have uh, osteosclerosis where you have more bone that is formed. So um, even if you don't die directly from this, it's extremely painful. There is a lot of skeletal related events and and, and therefore you need to, to understand this. So for, for me as a bioengineer, um, this is where it starts, uh, the osteoblast, which is um, considered by several papers as a key driver in this, in this disease. So what we do, um, we use what we call um, scaffolds or materials where we wanna create a 3D structure where we seed the cells and recreate what we call a, a mineralized tissue construct. Um, and for this, we can use human cells. And typically, we can use scaffolds that are biodegradable uh, polymers, or we can use uh, hydrogels with um, a composition or a treatment that will mimic um, the extracellular matrix, either by using calcium phosphate coating, which resembles the bone component, or using um, similar proteins. So gelatin is, for example, is a degraded form of a collagen, which is heavily uh, present in our bone. 
So this is um, what we use um, in the lab, and this is called melt electro writing. This is a bio uh, fabrication technique, and this enables to be printed in a certain uh, way that um, we have those very tiny fibers and porosity that we can then sterilize um, calcium phosphate coat and add some primary cells. And so we take those cells from, from patients um, and we try to differentiate them um, in culture, in the laboratory, so that we obtain what we call a nostoblast derived a bone like micro tissue. And this is just showing how um, these cells live in the scaffolds, um, assemble themselves into 3D uh, formats and deposit very relevant bone extracellular matrices. Um, not only do they deposit proteins, they also deposit uh, minerals. And this is what you can see here. Over time, you have uh, those mineral deposition. So the cells, you need to think of them embedded within those 3D structures, and they both deposit their collagen, their proteins, but also their, their minerals, which is extremely important uh, to recapitulate the organ um, that, that we are studying here. So um, I just want to raise, um, draw, draw, draw your attention to actually the differences of um, this is gene showing here in protein, where we traditionally, if you took those cells and you were going to do some drug testing or trying to, to find any new uh, treatments for disease, if you use a 2D model versus this new 3D micro tissue, you can see that the gene expression is extremely different from a 2D culture compared to the 3D culture. And the same goes with the proteins here. So this is patient one, patient two. In a 2D setting, you can clearly see that some of these proteins are very lowly expressed compared to the 3D setting, you know, and some of them are heavily recognized already in bone metastasis. But when you use this 2D model, these proteins are absent. So when you may treat um, this, you may not be able to actually have a, a reasonable system. So this is um, the, the, what I've just explained to you. We have this uh, scaffold that we, we coat with the, the cells. It Over several times, uh, several weeks, we actually differentiate and have those minerals. And the next step is to use then cancer um, cells. So and in the, the bigger picture of this work is really to use um, primary uh, cells from patients um, directly. And this is what we're doing at the moment. But just to introduce the concept today, I'll show you uh, what we do with the cell lines. So um, because we're interested in um, under androgen-targeted therapies, we've mimicked two very common prostate cancer cell lines, LNCAP and C42Bs, which are um, turned, we've turned red so that we can actually track them. So by seeding those cells on the mineralized micro tissue and adding some the standard of care uh, treatments in the clinic, but also new treatments, you can actually have um, an assessment of um, therapy um, in an in vitro model of human prostate cancer metastasis. So this is an example of, um, of the question that we ask, because as I mentioned earlier, um, androgen targeted therapies and especially endalutamide is very heavily used in the clinic at the moment. More and more studies are showing how, how it um, retards the disease. It was also shown that it retarded bone metastasis. However, the role of uh, enzalutamide in the bone tumor microenvironment was quite unclear. So we hypothesized that actually they have limited effects uh, and um, therefore they can even be a source of downstream adaptive responses that can fuel existing metastasis. So we used our model to test, um, you know, qualitatively, but also quantitatively the effect of those drugs. And we had to deliver new methods as well to do that, because commonly we work in 2D, we know how to do this. Um, um, however, when we go into 3D, we encounter a lot of different challenges. So the way to address this is first, uh, for example, to look at morphometry. So the morphometry is the morphology of your cells. And luckily, or yeah, unluckily, the cancer cells have a very specific uh, or different than normal morphology, which we actually can track and we can associate to um, unhealthy cells. So we decided to, to seed those cells, those LNCAP and C42B cells on top of our mineralized um, matrix, and then look at this morphology um, after supplementation of those enzalutamide and bicalutamide treatment. So this is what you know you look at because those cells are fluorescently labeled. You can individually uh, segment them. And the, the, the power of this approach is really that you can have in one single shot, you can get um, information on a lot of, of data. However, at this stage, uh, we really need to invest into AI as well to try to help us process this massive amount of data. But once once you've gone through there, you can really then have an assessment and answer a question. 
did, did this uh, drug treatments um, affect your cells? And so here, I won't go through the details as well, but um, we can clearly see that the ATT overall, when there were supplies in, in this model, they um, increased the volume and reduced the sphericity, which is a sign of adaptive response. So the bone microenvironment was really protecting um, that. So um, another interesting method that we've developed along the way is to check the, that migration um, uh, life. So here you can't see the black represents your mineralized micro tissue that, that has your embedded bone cells in there. And on top you have your cancer cells. And um, as you can see, we, we have this algorithm that enables us to, to track or some of the cells if they're not too uh, busy. And clearly you can see that LNCAP, which is very responsive, uh, dependent on testosterone, these cells are not very happy when they don't have the testosterone. As soon as you add this, you can see a high, high activity. So you can now think reverse that now you have your new treatment and you can use this model and see, did you actually reduce this migration? So this is what we, we've done with several parameters like track length um, ratio of, um, straightness and so on. And once again here, we could see that some of these cells were unaffected by the ATT and bicalutamide was also the least effective in those cells. And this is actually quite known now in the clinic. Um, the clinicians don't use bicalutamide uh, anymore and they've moved to densalutamide, which for me um, as a modelist is, is good, is a good sign that the model has some sort of validation. Um, this is what the, the micrometastasis of prostate look on the micro tissue. And again, um, looking over time, you can see those if those micrometastases, the area of them increase over time as a function of your drugs. So I'll jump to the conclusion that, yeah, again, once again, with proliferation, we could see that bacalutamide was really a poor drug to use in the microenvironment, but and anzalutamide was still also an effect, um, not effective in the presence of very highly metastatic uh, cells. So um, very briefly, you could look at the gene impression expression here. And the, the issue here is that we cannot quite sort these cells very well because they are truly embedded inside the mineralized matrix. And so when you try to separate them and collect them, fact sorting and analysis, it's very tricky. So in the early days, we just had to do the gene and, and protein analysis on, on the whole thing. Um, we still were able to find out that um, a few of the markers that are important in bone and in cancer were, were dysregulated and especially ALP. We know that um, patients with bone metastatic cancers typically have very high serum levels of um, alkaline phosphatase, and this is something that we also uh, saw at the, at the gene level. Um, androgen receptor was also both upregulated whenever we had you know, the cancer with, with the mineralized tissue, which really shows, again, the synergistic effect of cancer cells and bone to enhance um, ARR um, expression. So interestingly, um, you know, at, at the time we were really fishing, we didn't have a, an RNA-seq approach, although this is this is something that we are doing at the moment and also an in vivo sample. We could find out that um, those drugs in the bone marker environment actually increased bone marker, bone production uh, markers, so such as Renex2 or Stopontin, but also neuro-endocrine um, transdifferentiation markers, which um, some of them, such as the DCC, um, increases their activity and we know it plays a central role in castrate resistance. So it may mean that those drugs were actually activating some of those pathways um, that we know um, are seen in 2D cultures or in vivo. So um, I don't have more time to, to go through more results, but I hope I've just demonstrated to you how we can create those, those micro tissue in a, in a advanced, but at the same time, um, useful way. Uh, to have those co-cultures and use them for drug, drug testing. Um, it's really important yet yeah, to develop those imaging technologies. As I mentioned earlier, it's really important for us to have more uh, tools for data management and analysis. So um, again, anzalutamine really presented very little effect in, in the bone microenvironment. And, and therefore, um, if you have prostate cancer and it's in your bone, maybe think twice before you go on this drug um, because you, know, you may have some adaptive response um, uh, for that. So the next thing uh, for us, um, which we're already doing, is really to, to work with patient um, derived cells. Although it is very difficult to get our hands on prostate um, tissue with our clinicians, we, I typically get a lot of renal and lung. I'm collecting we're connecting a lung tissue right now, like lung in the bone, but the prostate happens only once, once a year. Um, so it's hard to get our hands on. So if you're a clinician sitting here, please contact me. I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much.
Hi, Natalie. Well done for getting to where you are. But as you said, the next step is to move into the human tissue. And I can understand the focus on uh, androgen-targeted therapies. But think about um, the increasing use of radiotherapies, both uh, therapeutically and diagnostically, and how many of our patient tissues are now going to have had things like lutetium PSMA. And I wonder whether you've got any idea of what that does to your models. Mm -hmm. It's going to add a great degree of complexity, but have you thought about that? Yes, absolutely. And so I have my colleague, um, Associate Professor Laura Bray. She's um, doing some of this work on her cancer models. So um, she's using a model that has a hydrogel instead of, of a scaffold. But um, yeah, they're already doing um, this on, on breast, not on prostate. The issue here is really, and you know, some of these issues are present here as well, is how do you mimic what's happening in vivo? what the, the dose of radiation you would give to a patient and how relevant is it to a, an in vitro model which doesn't have a full tumor microenvironment to really absorb some of these radiations. But yeah, definitely, yeah, there are people looking at this.